Good evening, good evening. Welcome to the news building. This is the home of the most popular newspaper in the UK and some of the most trusted titles in the world. I'm Gita Hani, I'm the Director of Commerce Corporate Affairs here, uh, and we are delighted to host you tonight. We are proud of what we do here at News UK. Um, our journalism here is in a fantastic place. Just ask Seb Blatter. He's been <laughs> splattered all over uh, the Sun's front pages this week. And um, literally, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that he probably would not have actually resigned if it wasn't for the excellence of the Times investigation into corruption at the heart of FIFA. Um, but it, 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 it's very wonderful for me um, to be introducing my former boss, um, our main guest speaker tonight, um, because we met Seb Latter together at City Hall, and last weekend we were trying to piece together that meeting, trying to recall what exactly had happened. And we did remember him saying a very, very sleazy way, where are the girls? <laughs> Normally when I turn up to places, there are girls. You know, I'm sort of Victoria's Secret models and what, and Boris Tan introduced him to his private secretary. <laughs> uh, Long-standing PA. Um, and I remember him in very sinister terms, saying, what is, the, what is the point of having power unless you use it? Boris recalled that as being abusive. Um, we also laughed at the petty event that we took him when we got him kicked out of Dorchester during the Olympics. Uh, it was the best we could do in response to him not rewarding the World Cup to <laughs> um, Anyway, but we are here tonight to remember a man who could not be more different to Seb Blatter. Yeah, yeah. A man yeah, who yeah, was yeah. conscious that he had power and there was a purpose to power, but a man who was very conscious of the restraint and the responsibility that comes with wielding power, and the sort of pressure to use that power for good ends. That's how I remember um, Simon Milton. The two of us were thrust together, having never met before, and told by CCHQ to make sure Boris didn't sort of crash off the rails. Um, I think we did our best on, on that front. Um, uh, I'm not sure we achieved it, um, but we certainly achieved great things. I mean, Simon, by Boris's side, helped deliver virtually everything Boris had promised the electorate uh, in his uh, first bid for power, and I think cracked the formula for modern, compassionate, cosmopolitan conservatism that allowed Boris to be re-elected in the left-leaning city mid-term, mid-recession, as it turned out, uh, in the middle of an only shambles uh, budget. Um, Simon was critical to everything. Simon was uh, a man of formidable intellect, Simon was a man of, of, of great achievement, and Simon, frankly, was a sort of ruthless operator who we all feared as well as admired and respected uh, and all rest it. But I remember Simon as a man who was a close friend and colleague and a decent, lovely man. And I remember more than anything tonight, what his sister Lisa said at, at his funeral was, as far as she was concerned, Simon could have been a milk. What she remembered about Simon was not the great achievements and all the rest of it, but the fact that he was a kind man with an awful lot of love to give. So we will hear shortly from Sarah Richardson, who's a close friend and trustee uh, of, of, of the uh, Memorial Foundation. But first, a short film just to remind us of the great man that we are here tonight to remember. Thank you very much for coming. The Simon Milton Foundation was established in the name of my late partner. He was Deputy Mayor of London, uh, leader of Western City Council, and chairman of the Local Government Association. He sadly passed away quite suddenly in, in uh, the spring of 2011. And the idea is to twofold, really. One is to look at young people and what we can do to help young people get on in the world by giving them a better education suited for what they really want to do. So what we're creating here at Edwin Bridge is a world-class state-of-the-art facility. It's the first kind of school of this type in uh, Westminster. We're open to providing a fantastic education to 550 uh, young people and schools specialised in transport engineering and construction. So we will 
encourage students to develop the skills and attitudes that businesses require. And to that end, we have businesses actively involved in the school. This is a fantastic opportunity for, for us as an organisation that employs uh, thousands, literally thousands of engineers, to influence the education and the development of a whole new generation of engineers. On the other side, to deal with older people and to try and address isolation and loneliness amongst many old people. And that's why we've set up Silver Sunday working with older people and trying to make one day here in October very special. I mean, Mother's Day and Father's Day, still Sundays, for us to recognise the older people. We need to have some fun, we need to have some companionship. This gives you a chance to go out and meet people and really enjoy yourself. It's wonderful. And my friends, um, we all in the church in Allison. Every student that comes out of that university technical college and every older person that feels that they're no longer alone and vulnerable, that's our anxiety. My Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the trustees of the Simon Milton Foundation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2015 to Simon Milton Lecture. First, I would like to thank Gutu, Mark, and the team at News UK for providing such a stunning and suitable venue. From this vantage point, we can see so much of the city which Simon had an important part in shaping. During his time as leader of Westminster City Council, as chairman of the Local Government Association and as Deputy Mayor of London. Secondly, I would like to thank our partner sponsors, the Victoria and the North Bank Business and Freedom Districts. Simon pioneered the introduction of BITS in the UK over 10 years ago. They are exemplars of how businesses can step up and invest collectively to improve their environment. Thank you also to our friends, APCO, the Global Communications Consultancy, to Property Consultants, Sparklers, and to Placemakers Capital for helping us to amplify Simon's legacy. Many people here this evening will have known and loved Simon. Others may not have had that privilege and may wonder why we are establishing a university technical college, supporting scholarships and bursary rules, and creating programmes to help tackle loneliness amongst old, old people, all in his memory. Quite simply, Simon's is a life worth remembering because of how his work and ideas impacted in the lives of others. He was a visionary, the outstanding civic leader of his generation, with a brilliant strategic brain. But he was also kind, principled, mischievous, a modest man who was respected and admired across the political spectrum. Simon was proof that you didn't have to be the loudest voice in the room to have the most influence. But when he spoke, people listened. And the quality of his ideas and the boldness of his ambition has left its mark on communities, in schools, on skylines, and in streetscapes across London and across the country. It is Simon's intellectual le legacy we seek to remember this evening by creating a platform for a leading figure to enrich the debate on creating and supporting opportunity, reflecting the things that inform Simon's work as a civic leader. Thus, it is my great pleasure to introduce Boris Johnson, parliamentarian, author, journalist, television presenter, cyclist, and of course Mayor of London, <laughs> uh, to deliver this year's Simon Milton Lecture. Simon loved working with you, Boris, and it is totally appropriate that you inaugurate this annual series. Simon said, Boris is probably the most fun person I've ever worked with, and it's quite nice not to have to make all the ultimate decisions. Boris recognises that one of the things that most affects people is their physical environment, and he wants it to be as good as it can be. He sees his role as constantly pushing for better quality. Boris, 
Tonight, we ask you to build on Simon's legacy, to build something of quality in his memory. We look forward to your tweet. Thank you, Kito. Thank you, News It's National, for hosting us here today. It's absolutely wonderful to see so many of you here, so many, so many friends, uh, of, of, and friends of Simon. Folks, I think back to the time when Simon and I went to City Hall on the eve of that mayoral election in 2008. The Guardian published an absolutely magnificent article, uh, characteristically magnificent article, in which assorted lefties prophesied disaster for London. If I were to oust Ken Livingston, they said a Johnson mayoralty would be a cruel and bigoted tyranny, an orgy of doctrinaire tax cuts that would do nothing for social justice or for ordinary Londoners. It would be racist, sexist, xenophobic, and fundamentally anti egalitarian. Uh, someone called Arabella Weir, an author, said that she would go on hunger strike <laughs> and throw herself under the next horse of Ascot. <laughs> Blake Morrison said he would emigrate to Australia if I were to go and check whether people have done this. Uh, Bonnie Greer said it would be the ultimate triumph of the Kensington and Chelsea command. Well, if she went by, by that, uh, some of you Daniel Boyd and I imagine. Uh, they, ignored, they ignored what I had expressly said in my maiden speech about my political credo, what I stand for. Uh, in, that was 14 years ago when I first entered Parliament and I said, uh, I could pray my family then and there in one nation, conservatism. It seems absolutely incredible, of course, that, that my critics had not read my maiden speech Parliament. Uh, but but there, there you go. Uh, what is less forgivable is that they wantonly ignored the key beliefs of my team. Absolutely, all above all, of Simon Bill, who was, by general consent, one of the most brilliant politicians of his generation. And who forged at Westminster, I see many people from Westminster here, a, a doctrine, a set of priorities and principles that he called One City. And that embraced notions of social responsibility and strong communities. And he had powerful campaigns to build homes for people who needed them, to get young people into work, as we've just seen in that excellent video, to fight loneliness in older people. And those ideas were ahead of their time, in the sense that they anticipated so much of the spirit of the modern Tory party today. And I think our, our critics then, back in 2007, eight. Uh, underestimating the simplicity and truth of our central idea, which is at the heart of One Nation Toryism, that it's only by having a dynamic market economy that you can pay for roads and rail and schools and hospitals and all the other vital objectives to help the poorest and the needy. So, symmetrically, it's only with excellent public <coughs> infrastructure and services and education that you'll create the platform on which the entrepreneurs and the wealth creators can build. So there's a circularity. And you can't bash one side of the equation, the wealth creators, without damaging the other, and, and, and vice versa. And I think our lefty firms, I don't know whether I can, I can speak of our in the context of the woman, but, uh, <laughs> our, I, I don't know how many people are concerned here, I don't think mine. Uh, our, our lefty firms didn't get it then. And I don't think, by the way, that Labour got it this year, because Emily Van seemed absolutely determined to try to divide society and to penalise wealth creators. I think, frankly, that's one of the reasons, one of many reasons, why they are not in power today. And seven years after Simon Milton and I were subjected to those diatribes, I look at that and I see the most successful urban economy in the world. Then you heard me say, well, what tax the most talented people from around uh, the world, 400,000 uh, French people fleeing the oh, more tourists. We all tour this this year and last year, first time in our lifetimes, uh, this year and last year, than any other city in the world, not in Paris and New York, of number one. What the fastest growing tech sector anywhere in the world, half a million jobs in tech now in, in London. And of course, I worry, as a one nation mayor, about the vast inequalities of income that are partly a function of that success. And I do worry that we now have more billionaires 
than any other city in the world. London is the billionaire is the jungles of Sumatra after the orangutan. Right? <laughs> 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 yeah, more billionaires uh, in the world than we Pantooting, pantooting around London, or whatever. Billionaireing around the place, and they have uh, they have orangutans in the last. We had 80 last year, I think, and then we had 140 billionaires uh, this year. You know, driving late at night in their Maserati and making terrible racket and places. I hope very much, by the way, that you. Well, when you clap them, Robert, that you can pound their cars and crush them. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, hardly any of them, I don't anybody that marries or artists, but uh, <laughs> hardly any of these characters, hardly any of them, some of them, some of them, not half, but very few, are taking the trouble to ensure that the companies they're associated with or that they, the conglomerates they invest in are paying their employees the London living wage. And I do worry. As a one nation there about inequality, I worry about it, of course, about inequality of opportunity. But if I have one message for you tonight, it is that there are many crucial and unexpected ways in which sensible, moderate one nation policies, such as have been pursued by Sir Simon, by me uh, in London over the last few years, are actually equalizing equalizing human outcomes in the most surprising but the most fundamental way. Let me tell you, since I have been mayor, 2008, you might be, female life expectancy has risen by 1.6 years on average, male life expectancy has risen by two years, so we live longer rather than conservatives. Um, <laughs> I'm catching up with women. There are parts of the Harrow Road in the London borough of Westminster, Robert, who are where they now, the average life expectancy is now 97 years old. Uh, by what monkey grams, I do not know. The most arresting statistic of all is the change in the discrepancy between the poorest and the richest boroughs of London. You'll be familiar with the, this appalling fact that in 2008, on average, the inhabitants of Kensington and Chelsea used to live about five years longer on average than the inhabitants of Barking and Dagenham. That gap today has now diminished to about three years. Now, the gap is so from five to about three, about five to about three, but it's gone down by about the same amount of both sexes. And of course, that gap in life expectancy between riches and poor is still a, a disgrace. And it's absolutely wrong that in the greatest city on earth, your life expectancy should be determined by your postcode. But what those statistics tell us is that insofar as the population of London is acquiring longer on this earth in comparative health and happiness to enjoy their children and their grandchildren, all the wonders of, of creation and where they will enjoy. Insofar as there is an increase in the overall quantity of life, to say nothing about the, the quality, therefore an increase in the overall sum of human happiness, if that concept has any meaning. It is the poorest and the neediest who have gained the biggest share of the increment. Do you follow me? Steve Greenhouse did not. <laughs> and you may ask yourself how that is happening, why that is happening, why is it that the poorest are living, comparatively speaking, uh, even longer than the richer folk? And since we are talking about life expectancy, let me ask you, what are the enemies of long life? What are, what are the, what's, what, how could you die? How could you have died uh, on the way here today? I don't know what, what we're going to not ask that. What, 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 what are the, what's the number one cause of accidental death? What, what? Road, thank you very much. Road, you might have had a road accident. Highly unlikely given we've seen the traffic in the moment. Uh, but, but, uh, but so that's, that's a very, very good cause for something that's a wonderful cycle to the highways, which are hugely popular uh, with motorists and taxi drivers across the <laughs> But you're absolutely right. Dying in a road accident is far more likely than dying in a plane crash or terrorist outbreak or many of the other things that we, we worry about. Uh, but what I think you might not have realized. Well, I do because I'm the chairman of TFL. Is that road KSIs are not uniformly distributed across the income groups? Absolutely not. 
if you divide up London into the geographical units of 1,500 people, what they call, what we demographers call super output areas, you can see how accidents disproportionately affect those with high measures of deprivation. And I'm afraid that in the poorer areas of London, your kids are five times more likely to be victims of road accidents, whether they are cyclists or pedestrians, than kids in the richer parts of London. And so when the numbers are going in the wrong direction, when road accidents are increasing, it is the poor who are hardest hit. But of course, when the figures are coming down, as they are now, and assuming the, they're coming down uniformly across all income groups, then the lives saved and the accidents averted will be most numerous amongst the most vulnerable in society. You still follow me? <coughs> and I'm proud to say they're now achieving astonishing improvements in road safety. The number of casualties is down by 40% since I became mayor. The number of people killed or seriously injured on our roads is now at the lowest level since records began. Pedestrian KSIs killed or seriously injured fell by 7% last year. People died in uh, accidents with cars uh, also fell by uh, 6%. Uh, number of cyclist KSIs are down by 12% just in one year, and they continue to fall. And you can see this phenomenon across the beast. It's not just on the roads that the poor will typically be the most vulnerable. If you look at virtually any cause of human mortality, you will see that the incidence is highest among the least well off. And so anything we can do, anything we can do in City Hall to tackle that problem will be to advance the cause of social justice. Take deaths by fire, for instance. Overwhelmingly, as you know, people have what's the biggest cause of death by fire? Anybody know? Could be thank you very much, Stephen, for paying attention. Uh, in the front row. Uh, the, the overwhelming cause of death by fire is chip pack fires. Uh, people coming in very rough days at night, uh, making chips in, in a drunken way and, 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 and carbonizing themselves. In, in, and and uh, of course, what's happened in the last uh, 20 years, and, and indeed the, the quality of late night food in London has so dramatically uh, improved. Uh, the, people, uh, the, the, the phenomenon of chip pack fires has fallen away philosophy. And I'm proud to tell you that thanks also to the efforts of the wonderful London Fire Brigade and to all the educational programs that they, uh, they did. We have cut deaths by fire. We have cut deaths by fire, which has, as I say, fallen disproportionately on the poorest in London. We've cut death by fire by 50% uh, in the last five years. It's a big period entirely at random. And, uh, and, and on it goes. Take poor air quality, which kills about 4,200 Londoners prematurely every year, which of course affects the poorest neighborhoods in London, doesn't it? You know, it's all very well you worry that you know, people who live in their stucco mosses in Notting Hill. Uh, you, 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 you perhaps don't worry so much about the impact of the third runway uh, on Heathrow as the people who are living in, uh, on lower incomes, living in neighborhoods in West London, who will see sensational increases in vehicular traffic and huge uh, decreases in the quality of their air. And uh, I, I can tell you that the London primary schools that have the misfortune to be in areas of poor air quality, 82%, 82% of those London primary schools affected by poor air quality are in areas of economic deprivation. So when we campaign to cut pollution, and when we reduce nitrogen dioxide emissions, as we have, by 20%, and when we cut PM10 to PM2.5, the dust up, as we have, by 15%, and when we introduce the ultra low emission zones, we will be lucky to. And when that comes in, and you can only drive clean vehicles into the centre of town, then those measures are not just good for the environment. They're not just good in the sense that uh, keys from, as I often say, from Norfolk will be bussed into the centre of London in order to inhale the clean air. <laughs> <laughs> that those measures. Those measures will be not just good for the environment, they will advance the cause of social justice. Of social justice and equality. will take, more obviously, murder or any other crime type. Virtually all of which, with the possible exception of you know, some complicated bank frauds, uh, all of which fall disproportionately on the poor. You are 30%, in London, you are 30% 
on average, more likely to be uh, affected by crime if you are in the lowest economic decile than in the highest decile. So when you do what we've done in the last few years and you cut the murder rate by 50%, you're doing something that addresses one of the great unfairnesses of life. And the same point could be made when uh, you look at the really, really deep kind of somebody at the, at the beginning of this long passage in my speech, uh, shattered out heart attack. You might die of heart attack. Well, those are the big calls. Obesity, kind of obesity, heart attack, cancer. What are they associated with primarily? Bad diet, smoking. And what are those associated with? Poverty. Isn't it? And you can only have to tackle those problems if you tackle the underlying poverty. And of course, that's what we are doing. That is the One Nation ambition. And I'm proud to say there are now 400,000, it's an amazing statistic from the DWP, I scarcely know whether to believe, but I'm sure it's true. There are 400,000 fewer people in London today living in relative poverty than there were 10 years ago. In other words, the, the boats are indeed all rising. They are indeed all rising. How, you may ask yourself, how is that possible? How are we beating not just absolute, but relative? And there are so many different answers, they all come together, but they all come together under the same formula that Simon believed in. Education. The reason Simon got a, a knighthood, of course, wasn't just because he was the most, as, as Gitto delicately hinted earlier on, the most subtle and brilliant political operator uh, of, the, of his time. But he was, he was, he was a consummate uh, politician. Uh, the reason he was knighted uh, by Tony Blair, you can't say that in any talk. <laughs> the reason he was knighted by Trump because he took on the National Union of Teachers and he helped to found those academies, didn't he? Peter, Rogers, where he? he helped to found those academies that lifted Westminster's academic performance and made so many of those schools absolutely outstanding and gave those kids chances they would not otherwise have had. And education is just one part of that vital platform, as I say, that platform of public services that is essential for the enterprise economy. Cutting crime, investing massively in transport, and we've been going through, since Simon and I came to City Hall, we've been going through the biggest phase of investment in our transport infrastructure since the age of the Victorians. Uh, those are vital for a more equal society. Transport is the great equalizer. Everybody on the tube is equal. You enable people to travel to the central activity zone of London to take part in the opportunities of the city in a way that would have been utterly impossible to people 50 years ago, even 30 years ago. And we've built record numbers of affordable homes. House building generally at levels not seen since 1981. And the result, as I say, is that the London economy is huge and growing, 25% of GDP, and we are seeing massive jobs creation meets at a 25-year low, employment at a 25-year high, and as, as uh, Simon Milton said, the best cure, the single best answer to poverty is a job. And I want to leave you with this final thought. My friends, with London growing at the speed it is, going to reach 10 million people by 2030, possibly even sooner. We have to cope with the very challenge that our colossal success is posing. And the crying sense of injustice of many Londoners, including our children, not even ourselves, our grandchildren, whoever, they simply cannot afford to live in this city. And I think that the house builders of this so you've done a fantastic job, but we've got to recognize that the system may be delivering what are technically record numbers, and we will build 100,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of this melody, but it has not delivered enough, has it? You know, London, London has never in the last 70 years done more than about 35,000 new homes a year, and we simply aren't keeping pace. I think we need to accept that housing is infrastructure, and whatever the problem is, whatever the blockages are, whether it's to do with the planning system or with NIMBYism or 106s or 
land banking, or whatever the, whatever the issues are. We need now to smash down those barriers to delivery. And so I've decided that working with the uh, Chancellor and with Greg Clark at uh, Department Communities and Local Government, uh, we will be much more active and more directed in this area. We will now be forming a new agency, Homes for London, to help to deliver this vital infrastructure just as TfL delivers transport improvements. And we know that the Brownfield sites are available. We have the London Land Commission are coming on stream to make available all the public sector land. And to get those sites viable, we've got to make sure that we up the tempo of the transport investment. I'm delighted that the Chancellor has uh, spelt out his long-term economic plan. Three Tories have to get to every speech. Uh, George has spelt out his long-term economic plan for London. The prime amongst which is, of course, Crossrail 2, of which you are all the fiction on this, I think. Does everybody know what Crossrail 2 is? Uh, is everybody here an avid supporter of Crossrail 2? Can I count on you? Yeah. To lobby incessantly so that we get Crossrail 2 by 2020 in the same state of readiness that Crossrail 1 was in 2010 when the coalition government. Okay, can I count on you? Yeah. Come on, Crossrail 2. The Bay Line Extension, new bridges, new tunnels, all those things have got to be done uh, to liberate those housing groups to get our people the homes that they need. It's absolutely vital. If we're going to make this thing work, we have to put our foot to the pedal in a clean, environmentally friendly uh, <laughs> <laughs> London, London is on the top. London is the leading city in the world now, isn't it? No question. We are the capital of Mundi. We're the greatest city on earth. We're the world's leading urban brand. Everybody wants to be. Of course they But I warn you folks, we haven't always been that way. And every brand needs refreshing. And we've got to be thinking about the future. And that's why I think we should now be applying. I want you to get behind this too. We should now be applying to host Expo 2025. Yes, let me go to It'll be fantastic. We'll be able to regenerate that whole elbow there on the uh, that part of the Docklands area that hasn't yet been touched by the magic of the Olympic uh, legacy, and we'll be, and it will be able simultaneously to show London's growing lead in those 21st century technologies. Let's go, God, right? let's get behind Expo 2025. Let's bring it uh, to London. And I think if we can get all those things right, and I'm absolutely sure that we can, then we can not only to summarise my speech, we can not only have a society that is both more prosperous, but also one that is more socially just. And we can do it, by the way, by cutting taxes too. That was the one thing that uh, our critics got right back in 2007 8 They said we'd be a savage uh, thatch right tax cutters. They were right there. Uh, we cut taxes in uh, labour, they get put up uh, their share of council taxes by 153% and then did we in City Hall cut your council tax by 20% and I'd like to say we still have uh, supplies of Ken Livingston's shadow of uh, Japan. <laughs> such as we are, such as we are frugality. That is the that is the that is the Milton, that is the Milton, that is the Milton form. The sensible cost cutting, tax cutting, one nation government delivering better services. He came up with the idea of a one nation city. I think he's been so influential now in modern Tory politics. You could say that what we have is a one city nation or something like that, if you follow uh, what I'm trying to say. Uh, at any rate, I'm absolutely thrilled, but thanks largely to the work of some of his friends here, Tony Fidgley, uh, Dean Godson, and others. There are now almost as many statues of Sir Simon Milton in London. <laughs> as there are of Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think he would have cared about that. I don't think he would have, I don't think Simon would have been interested in that. I think he would have been proud to think that his legacy is actually everywhere in what we love. And I'm very, very proud to have worked with him. I'm proud to have known him, and I hope I speak for 
many, many people here to our side uh, pride to have come to Simon. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Foundation, I'd like to thank Boris for delivering this evening's lecture. You have filled the platform that Simon has given me by talking about um, your One Nation of Great Vision and how you and Simon work together on the elevation of the condition of people, something which I hope will continue, um, whoever takes over from you, but also in your work that you continue to do um, um, in the House and in your future career. Well, I'd like to thank again you two and our sponsors for all the work they have done to help support this evening's lecture. Please so continue at the bar. And if you'd like to know anything about the work of the Society of Milton Foundation, get involved or make a contribution. Um, we'd love to, please do get in touch with us here for you. We wish you all a very safe day again. Thank you very much for coming.